How many of you thought I was going to play something there? <laughs> no, I'm not going to play any music today, though you're going to hear some music. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about the importance of the human breath in music. I'm not going to start at the beginning of music because nobody really knows what that sounds like. Nobody really knows what it sounded like until they started writing it down. So I'll start with musical notation, specifically Western notation. Now there's earlier primitive forms of notation, but we'll stick with Western for now because that's what I know about. So it started around 1000 AD uh, with a man by the name of Guido de Arezzo. His genius idea was to write it down so that we could pass it on that way instead of passing it on orally throughout the ages. Guido's big invention was four horizontal lines. What we did with those lines, he put little symbols on there that represented shifting pitches. Now I'm going to play you a piece from around this time that's very representative of Gregorian chant at the time. And I want you to pay particular uh, attention to the spacing in the music. I'll give you a hint. It's represented by a vertical line. So let's hear. Now, some of you may have noticed that the pauses are there for a reason. Why? So you can take a breath. Uh, Guido and early music uh, composers of this time were dealing only with the human voice and only the voices singing together, no separate parts, what's known as unison. So the breath had to be put in there, so therefore there's a space for it. I'm going to move on about 450 years to another composer by the name of Josquin de Pre. Now, Josquin is still only using the human voice. However, we have a few different parts here, a few different voices singing different parts. This became known as polyphony. But the breath still needs to be in there. I want you to listen to this and pay attention to the breaks. They're going to be notated by little rectangles. Let's hear Now, as I said before, we're still only dealing with the voice, no accompanying instruments, but there's something different about this piece. The music is continuous throughout until the end. How does this happen? We have one voice coming in, another voice coming in underneath that, and so on, with each respective voice jumping out when it's time to take a breath. The most powerful part of this piece I just played you, though, is the very end, when all four voices come together into a big crescendo and then stop, for what? So everybody can take a breath. This sort of crescendo into a stop became known as a cadence, and we're going to talk a little bit more about those later. I'm going to move on another 300 years or so to Mozart, and this is a string quartet, so we're not dealing with the breath here. Let's hear Okay, so what we have here is a string quartet. So the breath, while these people ideally will be breathing, it's not required to make a sound on the instrument. Um, but the pauses are still there. Why? Now they've gone from being required to take a breath to a more aesthetic approach. I'm going to play this again, and I want you to pay attention to the pauses. Now, we have little connecting parts in there, so don't mind those. 
the pauses are really there to give weight to the crescendo and cadence and then weight to the beginning of the next section. So I'm going to play that again and I'll point out to you where these parts are and pay attention to what happens before and after the break. Let's hear it one more time. Crescendo one, cadence one. Break. Break number two. Break number three. Here's the long one. Now what's interesting to me is, like I said, these people don't need to take a breath. That's primarily why the music is continuous. But he's still following the rules of the pacing of the crescendo and the cadence. Now, if you're anything like me, you're probably sick of all this classical music, so let's move on to something we probably all know a little bit better. Now, we're going to listen to some Beatles, and I want you to pay attention to the pauses in this as well. Let's hear it. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be, 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 whisper words of wisdom, let it be. Okay, so the pacing of this song is pretty simple. You have a melody that ends with the lyric, let it be, and then a pause, and then it goes into the next section. So the music underneath is continual. The piano is playing the whole time. The bass is playing, not yet, but it starts later in the song. So why is Paul taking these breaths there? Why he, They could be anywhere. It's because he's following the same rules of the, the, uh, the crescendo, the cadence, and then the break to really let the weight set in. So now we're moving in even more into aesthetic territories, and I want to talk about a little bit more of an abstract, abstract application. How about when this inserted silence does not come as a result of the pacing in the music and is inserted more abstra uh, aesthetically abstractly? I'm going to start with Miles Davis. Miles Davis was a very famous jazz trumpet player, obviously an instrument that you need to breathe for. But he was known for inserting long silences in his music, way longer than necessary to take a breath. I'm going to play you his most famous composition. This is So What? Let's hear it. Now, this composition is full of spaces. The horns play there, then they rest. They play here, they rest again, way longer than they need for a breath. Now, pay particular attention to Miles' solo coming up right here. Now that solo we just heard is about 50% playing and about 50% silence. Am I on here? Um, it's about 50% playing, 50% silence. This is something that became to be a definitive character characteristic of Miles' style. Another very famous jazz musician named Thelonious Monk had a quote that went something like, sometimes the notes that you don't play can be more important than the notes that you do play. So Miles really incorporated this into his sound and it's influenced generations of jazz musicians since. Another sort of aesthetic uh, application of this was known as the grand pause. This was really popular with orchestral music in the 18th, 19th century. The orchestra would come together in a big crescendo cadence and then end, and then the conductor would lead them on to the next section. Much like some of these other things we talked about, it would give weight to the part that came before, weight to the part that came after. This went out of vogue in the 20th century in popular music, I think primarily because of recording technology. You see, early recording technology only enabled you to make a song that was three minutes long or so. 
So songwriters didn't have a lot of room for space. They had to jam everything they had to say in a really short amount of time. Another example um, is by a composer named John Cage. He wrote a piece in 1952 called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds. Now this piece can actually be any length of time. It can be played by any instrumentalist, any singer, anybody, any one of you. What this consists of is a performer getting up on stage and just standing or sitting there for the duration. Now, this, the music that came from this would enc encapsulate maybe a cough from over here or the train from over there or maybe a baby crying. <laughs> I think what Cage was saying here was that sometimes we need to pay more attention to the music in our lives and not particularly to the music that's happening on stage. Now, there's a lot of really, really great contemporary examples of spacing and musical breath. I'm going to use just one from a couple years ago. <clears throat> this is a song by James Blake. And many of his songs really use silence beautifully. This one in particular, I really feel, gives added weight to the sections that come before and the sections that come after, much like some of the other things that we've heard. There's two uh, excerpts here. Let's listen to the first one. There's a limit to your love, your love, your love, your love. There's a limit to your care. Now we're going to move a couple minutes later in the song and play you some even longer pauses here. There's a limit to your care. There's a limit to your care. So carelessly there. There's a limit to your care. There it is. So this song, this song is about three minutes and eighteen seconds long. We have 30 seconds of silence in there. But to my ears, this silence really helps the song breathe and make it aesthetically a lot more pleasing than if the music was continuous throughout. Now, Miles and James Blake and John Cage, they weren't consciously thinking of the human breath. However, my theory is that these limitations realized by the earliest composers and accounted for really led a, started a heritage and made the path towards more artistic applications of the human breath. Now, I'm going to talk about how a couple little techniques can help you along this path a little more effectively, possibly. Let's move back to the physical for a second. Most people in their daily lives only use about 20% of their lung capacity. Now, this will keep you alive, but it's kind of like the rice cake of breaths. There's not really any substance to it. So a lot of musicians, singers, uh, and instrumentalists will breathe all the way from the bottom of the diaphragm. The way that I uh, do this sometimes is by mouthing the word I'm when I'm breathing in. This enables you to get the whole breath. Now, I want you to try this with me. I'm going to give you three counts. We breathe in for three and out for three. Ready? One, two, three. <sighs> Rest. Let's try it again. One, two, three. <sighs> out. You may be a little lightheaded, and that's because you don't breathe like this normally. Nor should you all the time, and you'll probably pass out. But I think like a couple well-timed breaths like this every day can really help you through your day, like if you're getting ready for a test or you're trying to ask somebody out on a date. It's been shown to really increase athletic ability, improve the blood flow, sometimes even make you happier. Now to the abstract. I think we also have room in our daily life for more abstract applications of the breath, like consciously inserted breaths. Imagine if you eat a delicious bite of food like we just had. Maybe give three or four seconds and really appreciate that bite. Or imagine if you're having an argument with a loved one. Before you say something really hurtful, give it four or five seconds, and I don't think you'll probably say what you were going to say before. Or if you're reading a really wonderful passage in a book, just give six seconds in between and, and really sit there and, and appreciate what the author was saying. So I think if we use this physical and abstract application of the breath in our life, I think you'll find you'll be able to make your path a little bit more effectively, and it can even make your life a little more fulfilling and possibly even happier. Thanks.